Hi, this is Eddie Beeson. You're listening to Breaking the Fourth Wall. I was Mandark in Dexter's laboratory. Ha 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 ha. Hey, what's up, guys? Chris Ristale here, back for another Breaking the Fourth Wall podcast interview. This time I'm sitting down with uh, a guy who's kind of been born into the business, uh, from what I understand. We're going to dig in and uh, really get to know him a lot better. It's Kavian. Uh, I swear I'm trying this. And you know what's funny is you guys can see it on oh, screen. Keep going. Way, you guys can see it on screen the same way I can. So you know I'm struggling with this. But uh, Mosin... Mozin Zadesh. Mozin Zadesh. It was a good and try, was, Chief. Was it close? <laughs> nope, not at all. But you know, ah. that's why it was a good try. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing today? <laughs> Pretty good, brother. Just uh, have it all kind of out in the air. It's uh, Kayvon Mosin Zadeh. Zadeh, okay. Mosin yeah. Zadeh. So I got the first part right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I tried. I, I was struggling with the uh, going from Zen to Za. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it, it, people get all mixed up. It's almost as if like uh, some slight dyslexia. The Z and the S get switched around so often. It's so mm-hmm. often. Me. But well, uh, yeah, good, good way, you know, a good way to just kind of keep it in mind is I always try to separate for everybody. So with first name, you know, every kiss begins with K. You shop at Vaughn's. <laughs> there, K Vaughn. And then Mosen. Mosin, you know, there's like a gas company, I guess, that uh, sells that. You go to Costco, they have that brand. And then Zade. Okay. Oh, right on. So, uh, you know, I, again, you can see my last name. I mean, I, you heard me say it in the intro, but I mean, if I had not said it, you, I guarantee you would have said it wrong. Probably. Most people do, you know, so <laughs> I, I understand where you're coming from. That, that was a mouthful, though. But, uh, you know, again, the go, we're not going to spend a half an hour talking about your last name. We're going to talk about your career and you and you know, obviously the first question we got to go into, which I go into anybody, obviously you're an actor. What made you want to get into acting? It's a really great question, shoot. I, um, so I actually have always enjoyed different forms of entertainment. Um, when okay. I was a kid, I used to be really, really into pro wrestling, like so much. It's a little, I was like, addicted to it all the time. I always wanted to try and buy pay-per-views. My dad would always find it. I'd be blasting his credit card. And I'd be like, hey man, I don't know where that money went. I just, you know, just went out <laughs> there. But I remember, cause I would watch like promos and stuff like that and announcers when they would like use their voice and project to, for the ring. And I'd always just think like, I want to do that kind of stuff. I wasn't really too like physically active. So I wasn't really about like actually doing the pro wrestling moves, but I enjoyed the storytelling behind it. Right. And it was from there, like as time kind of progressed. I went through high school and stuff like that. And my, I grew up in a very, um, uh, very Middle Eastern, old country kind of household. So very much my options were as a, Iranian American boy was to become either a lawyer, a doctor, a used car salesman, or <laughs> an engineer, which my father was. But I decided, no, nah, you know, why don't I go into acting? I mean, I, I mean, you know, the economy is going to hell. I mean, I don't really see what else I could really do that I'll enjoy. Right. I hate math. Both my parents are mathematicians. So. <laughs> Why don't I just, you know, go into acting and be that kid? So I've been working at it for about maybe four on my almost five years now. And I haven't really stopped and I've loved it ever since, you know, just doing theater, film. Uh, Now, actually, I'm currently part of a soon to be reopening uh, ghost tour that we're doing here in San Diego called Haunted San Diego Ghost Tours. Nice. Well, you know, I got to I got to dissect everything you said here. And I'm going to start off with the fact that you. I know uh, your publicist, our our mutual friend Steve Joyner, mentioned to you that I was an independent professional wrestler. Oh yeah. So with knowing the fact that you love pro wrestling and that was something that you had thought about doing, why didn't you pursue? I mean, okay, I understand you're you're kind of a smaller guy, but I mean, there's there's smaller wrestlers, and I mean, you know, they do make creatine. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I, I can't imagine that's the only reason why you didn't didn't pursue that interest. 
there I always feel like um because I really enjoyed like just the the art of it and just seeing it a lot and I was into uh, martial arts a lot as a kid too so I really enjoyed the idea of self-defense my problem was more so uh, my family's like very much like they didn't really want to see me get injured or hurt and I got into a couple bad accidents when I was a lot younger so it kind of affected a lot of like how much I would actually participate in sports which is why I kind of had to get into more um kind of theatrical stuff less actual combat but then now that I'm getting into more stage combat again and doing a lot more movement work um in like my kind of last years of college I'm realizing pro wrestling is just the exact same I mean you know in some way shape or form it's a lot of just like like work and dedication but it's a lot of movement centric stuff where you're working with another person to really make a good product which is a a show you know well I'm really kind of leaning towards like wanted to do some kind of like taking pro wrestling classes now actually 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 it's kind of funny because when you really break down a a particular match for people that don't necessarily understand the inner workings of the of the business and and i know nowadays kayfabe's dead so you can pretty much look this up you know um it's not just the two combatants in the ring uh that tell a story it's it's all the people around you've got uh managers and you've got uh referees they're all involved with it so i mean even if somebody who loves pro wrestling but may not physically be able to handle the uh, the day to day rigors of, of being a a worker in the ring, the, there's still options to be able to be a part of the show, whether it be in front of the camera or even behind it as like you know commentation or or you know even ring security. You know, oh man, everything. my like dream job actually like straight up before anything else, my dream job was to be a ring announcer. Like I love the idea of it, just the <laughs> idea of being able to go. And uh, introducing first, weighing it at 287 pounds from Death Valley, California. You know, just that kind of like level <laughs> of projection, you know? I, I love just building the hype behind a person before they even come out into the ring yet, you know? And just seeing that kind of dynamic, hearing when people would say lines like, The Undertaker! Or like, you know, just, just hearing the edge and the voice and all that kind of stuff, it was you know, got you hyped. And I love that kind of stuff, you know? Like where I lack in, I guess, physical aspect, I try to make up for in voice. <laughs> right. Well, yeah, I was about to say, you did a great job there. And uh, I was also going to say too, I mean, even when I, you know, even when I go to bed with my wife, you know, you put on some Michael Buffer, you're, you're set to go, man. Let's get ready to rumble, you know? <laughs> you can't beat that. that. Up, you know? <laughs> <laughs> Definitely hypes you up. But uh, of course she rolls her eyes. Um, <laughs> so anyway, anyway, you said you, 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 for going the, the pro wrestling route, you, you started looking into acting. What was the first step for you? Was it, uh, was it stage or was it film first? It was, it started off with, um, a little bit of stage. Like I was in my senior year of high school or whatever, and they did a musical and I was like, okay, I need it for the credits. Why don't I just kind of join it? And then I kind of got into it. I was like, hey, this stuff is actually kind of fun. We sucked at it because we were an underpaid, you know, high school trying to do uh, musical theater. But <laughs> after that, I was like, wait, I like acting. Yeah, all right, I can get into this. So I was like re-watching a lot of old, like, De Niro, Al Pacino movies. A lot of, I really love, like, old gangster films and stuff like that, too. Because they had some really fine actors in there, like Joe Pesci and stuff like that. And, and really just kind of watching them work. I was like, I want to do that. I want to get into uh, that kind of work. And so I did a little bit of film acting. And the problem is with San Diego is a long time ago, maybe about five, 10 years ago or so, San Diego used to have a really good film um, community, like, like very booming. That's because they were filming stuff like Veronica Mars and stuff here. Right. And eventually that kind of fell through. And so now it was a lot more independent filmmaker just kind of working around stuff here. So I got to work with a lot of people from college, a lot of people who were just trying to get a start and stuff. And you know how it is when you're getting barely paid or not paid at all and saying, I want to be an actor. I, I want to just try and experience this and, and really get into this, this job. And then you realize everybody here is just trying to, you know, make a quick buck or some kind, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, make this film, it's going to be really graphic and gory, you're going to die. Okay, I, I'm fine with dying, that's no problem. <laughs> and, you know, it was like a lot of those kind of films, my signature thing was in, I'd say maybe four out of the five, like, short films I've done is I died. 
<laughs> well, you know, like, uh, like, uh, you know, not, again, not to harp on the, the wrestling thing. I, I said this in an interview that I was being interviewed for one time uh, about my wrestling career. And I said that actually throughout my career, one of my favorite, my favorite points was always when I was the bad guy. Um, you know, uh, the good guy was great. Of course, you love hearing your name chanted and, and cheered and kissing babies and slapping hands. But to be, to be the guy that everybody hates to say what's on your mind regardless of consequence like you can't beat that i got to imagine even for an actor as fun as it is to be the hero to be captain america or spider-man you know it's got to be fun to be dr doom once in a while you know what i mean i i got I, what what about for you like which which is preferred the good guy or the villain more often than not i mean you know you look at me right <laughs> whether you're in film or theater you see this and you see these eyebrows and you're like it's just always going to be the bad guy. I can't pull off. Like, uh, I, I'm a nice, like, teenager and stuff like that. But just whenever I would kind of come into an area, you know, it's despite I'm very kind of chill, laid back and stuff. But when I get into it and you give me a role where it's a really bad guy. Right. You get into it, you know? And it's just this kind of thing where you enjoy taking your time with the audience and really building it up for how much they are supposed to hate you you know and more often than not because of how audiences work i mean even in pro wrestling scene people love to hate people and especially when you're a really good heel people love that stuff mm -hmm. so when i would play villains i would always want to try and make myself like a little charismatic it's almost as if it's like i'm trying to convince you i'm not a bad guy sure i do bad things but i'm not a bad guy everybody's here awesome. on their own mystery. Yeah. yep yeah, it's, it's just, it's fun because for them, it's more often than not, I feel like people can relate to a villain at times because a, a, a lot in um, like theatrical scripts too, especially, you often see that there's more development for the character and the villain than there is for the hero because they're so, you know, perfect at times or like right. they're a paragon of some kind of archetype where you're supposed to be the the every man character that everyone is supposed to kind of look on as like this good person. But the villain is someone you relate to because it's like, I really have a hard time believing anybody is that perfect. <laughs> when you see somebody who is, you know, has been down on his luck, especially when it's something when it's like his society, other people, um, you know, himself that has kind of caused like certain issues in his life to occur, they become villains to the public or the majority because they are viewed as potentially an outcast. Well, the question, the question is, is like, I, and I know as an actor, you don't necessarily get a say in the, the way the, char the character is written in, in roles that you've done, but which is your preferred type of villain to play? Do you like to play the one where it's, uh, he's just an everyman who, who he feels he's doing right, although others may be, view it wrong, or the typical, for lack of a better term, the, the, the Saturday morning uh, funny pages guy twirling the mustache like you over the top you know hey, it's the bad guy you know I, what I, mean? I have done both i have promised <laughs> you. Like, which, one, which one's preferred honestly it really is the um the man who's faced with circumstances beyond his control and he has to try to fight against it despite everybody telling him that he's wrong for it right because you, you get into the mindset of how people become this way or why certain people might happen to feel like they've been shunted or or pushed away from the world and why do they become kind of cruel or jaded or cynical towards everything it's not like they just kind of woke up one morning and they decide i'm going to hate the world it's you know years of like issues and traumas and problems that they have they had no time to be able to experience or talk about or work with you know another person and it kind of makes them into this monster to other people right and it's it's really kind of like it kind of goes back to one of my favorite books um frankenstein by mary shelley it's very much like misunderstood creatures not able to kind of experience or appreciate the, the world in the same way because some other circumstance won't allow them to and i feel like you do that to any human being they'll become what you would consider a villain well it's kind of like the jokers uh the joker in a uh uh killing joke uh, exactly one bad day all it takes is one bad day exactly um but i definitely want to jump in here like uh well the next question i'll ask I'll, before i jump into your actual filmography here uh 
which do you prefer? Do you prefer uh, doing your craft on uh, on film, on set, on location, whatever, or do you prefer the stage? Uh, which which where you get kind of get more of an instant feedback? Which which do you prefer to perform your craft? Personally, like as an actor. I like working on film, honestly, because it, it gives me this chance to kind of be able to work a little bit more intimately, a little bit more fine tuned. And the fact that the camera captures everything, I feel like I don't have to necessarily try so hard to reach that back row or to do stuff like that. But as an entertainer, and for me personally, I love live theater. Anything live is fun. I enjoy just being in front of somebody who is taking me in as I'm taking them in. And it's just, right. there's something magnetic about it. You know, and I'm sure you know, especially like being a former wrestler, being in a ring and being around an audience, it feels different. Oh, yeah. You know? And and just you you feed off of that. And, and any time I get to be in a show, I really think about that because every single time I'm with like other actors are like, oh, man, I hate this audience or, oh, man, these guys are dead. We have a dead crowd here. What are we supposed to do? And really, it's very much like, no, no, we have to work with them. Right. Like if something's not clicking, then we got to communicate it better. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And it's always this kind of big um, moment of trying to work through these like um, things that are happening on stage and communicating it to an audience so that they're with you. And that, I think just something about that makes everything worth it, you know? Right. You really know that they're, li when you know they're listening to you, it's like a pin drop. And when you have them like that, it's like, <laughs> I, I, I've been trying to explain it, but really it's, it's something else entirely. It no, I get it. I get it. Uh, actually a friend of mine and I uh, had a match in Colorado years ago yeah. and uh, we, we battled against each other. We worked hard like for a month on this match. We wanted to, wanted it to be phenomenal. We were pulling out stuff that we thought you never saw before. And uh, the match is actually on YouTube. And Jeez. we thought it was a bomb. When we performed it live, you could hear a pin drop. Nobody was reacting. Now, for a wrestling show outside of Japan, that, yeah, that's horrible. You know what I mean? You know. And later on, we come to discover, watching the match again, listening to some of the other people that have seen the match before, it's like, dude, you don't understand. You were getting the, the silence out of respect. People were just enraptured in what you guys were doing. You're, you're right. You know, you want the reaction because that's what you expect to get. And when you get silence, sometimes you can misread that. You know? <laughs> it's really keeping it like, like knowing where they're at with you. And that's like, I don't know, it does get a little bit nerves rack up and you're thinking to yourself, am I doing a good job? Am I doing a good job? That's like my worst problem for me personally. Cause sometimes um, when I would do shows, especially my uh, early years of kind of acting, it would always be like, am I doing a good job? Do you guys like me? Do you love me? And then eventually, you know, you get past that and you feel like what I'm doing is what I'm doing. It's my work. I put the time in and try to craft it as best as I can. However they're reacting to it is however they're reacting to it. I just have to kind of be attentive. No, you're, you're, you're not wrong. And especially when it comes to the instant gratification, like the reactions of the crowd, be able to gauge yourself. One of the things I absolutely hate about podcasting is uh, the fact that, uh, you know, especially on our, our weekly show where you're trying to be funny and you don't have that instant audience gratification of uh -huh. knowing that they're laughing or whatever. You have to wait till the episode releases or whatever. You know, I, I do miss the days of going out in front of the crowd where even though I'm, I'm bare and naked, it's like I, I, I see their faces and I see what they dig and what they don't. You know, so I definitely get where you're coming from with that. But I mean, you're, you're right. It, it is nice to have that. I mean, I could take this show live. I could go live. I could go live on Facebook live or something like that. But then all the flubs, all the mistakes, all the screw ups exactly. there. And I'd rather give them a better product. <laughs> it's, it, it's a very, it's a different kind of balancing act. And I feel like the weirdest thing right now is this odd synchronous thing that people are trying to do where, um, especially for a lot of theaters now is trying to mix zoom and theatrical performance in the same kind of medium and it's really getting hard to read sometimes because you see some of these people who are so used to being in front of an audience or being able to work in front of an audience and trying to apply the same things they've kind of learned especially for um, some people like that I've worked with um, in theater just kind of seeing them and they have to make this transition into realizing you have a camera here 
you're doing film acting in a sense now. Right. You got to kind of adapt to it in, a, in that kind of viewpoint and being able to accept that makes the work a little bit easier, but also understanding that this is uncharted territory. So I feel like podcasting is like a great way to get started with is why I really appreciate being on the show because getting better at this is just me getting better at my work. I'll, I'll tell you what, man, it's a trial and error process. When I first started this, uh, I started breaking the fourth wall with a uh, me and two friends and we would co communicate on my phone on speaker. And I had a digital recorder sitting next to the uh, receiver. So <laughs> that's how I started the show. That's yeah. literally how I started the show four years ago. So, I mean, I'm still figuring out all the, the uh, inner workings of there's people that have got better shows than I do. And I know that, you I know, mean, I'm, I'm working, everybody can do it, you know, yeah, I'm working on it, but you know, the thing I'm, I'm mesmerized by this. So, so theaters are actually during the COVID crisis right now, they're trying to do their performances via Skype and like what releasing them on YouTube. Yeah, so, so it, it's a little bit of a mixed bag. Some of them have just been um, more of the professional ones who actually have like a vault of like old performances or just kind of showing those on stream and getting donations from that to kind of keep okay. themselves afloat. Other companies not so lucky. They're trying to do like different forms of uh, trying to produce some form of theater. So some people have like uh, meet and greets where you can talk to uh, artistic directors uh, famous actors, stuff like that. Just try and get like publicity and stuff like that coming in. Right. Because um, it all runs on donations. That's all donors make theater run. And when you don't have donors, can't keep the lights on. But for um, a lot more like fledgling stuff, and especially for um, educational theater, like being in a university trying to do stuff, um, they're trying to find ways to get people to get the experience they need while still being able to present a show for them to put on right. like a resume. So that's kind of where I'm at right now in this weird in-between point. Um, I've done a couple of Zoom shows and a lot of them have actually been more so um, readings of new pieces. So the most recent thing I did was I did a whole Zoom show entirely about uh, a DD and d uh, musical, which was a crazy show. It was like a uh, choose your own adventure. The audience had like a, um, you had to like, a, had a, what do you call it? Uh, a, uh, a chart to see like which uh, choices you wanted to pick and then like those choices affected like whatever ending you would get out of the show there was, oh, like, yeah, it was a bunch of cool different kind of stuff and then you have like changing backgrounds different costume pieces it was like as if you were viewing um if you ever played like those old uh command and conquer games where they have just like all the different screens yeah. of characters speaking that's essentially what we were doing and it, was, it worked because it was stylized so we we were kind of self-aware that yeah, we're in a Zoom environment, but we're having fun while doing it. So it gave us a little more lead way. So, so essentially it was Dungeons and Dragons, but it was kind of like a, the best way to describe it is like, like to choose your own adventure books back in the day. Exactly. Where it's like, go to page, if you choose this format, go to page 13. If you choose this format, choose page 64. Kind of, kind of like one of those types of views. It is exactly like that. And the thing is, it was hell for us as the actors because, like, we would just have to keep on scrolling through. So if we didn't get like the uh, initial choice that was like right below the text, we would have to scroll past all that on our screens and then get to that text and then be able to be like, okay, good, we know where we're going. And then we have to mark down all the different choices people pick throughout the show because then we'd have to pick one of eight endings. It was oh, wow. crazy amount. This guy was, what I loved about the show was it was nerds first, musical theater people second. They okay. really cared about the work. And more often than not, you might see this a lot in like some shows. You'll see people who are like, I want to make a piece about um, this certain topic that maybe I'm not completely involved in, but I know theater. So I want to try and produce it. And oftentimes you don't get the soul out of it. That's kind of the problem with a lot of productions. Oh, but with this I'll be honest with you. I'm I'm a I'm a D and D nut, and I think one of the things that's failed uh, in in the uh, in in the world where Lord of the Rings exists mm -hmm. is how we don't have a decent D and D movie. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we've there's like a couple small ones like Kickassia and a, a couple other like you know I I feel like I always look at Pick a Destiny as one of those. It's like this is what I would call something close to the same energy as a D, D show right but you look at dragon lance uh dragons as autumn twilight which i don't particularly hate but it, it, it wasn't it wasn't true yeah. to form to the book or yeah. you know even even the uh the, the three movies people are surprised that there are actually three movies 
of Dungeons and Dragons, which I did actually like the first one with uh, uh, with uh, Marlon Wayans and all that. I actually did like it, but the other two were complete garbage. And to this day, especially on the day where people are talking about like getting people of color in the forefront and leading roles and everything else, how do we not have a Dritz Duarden movie yet? Where 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 is Dragon so or, or Forgotten me? Realms? <laughs> I wish for it. That'd be so dope. I mean, that's kind of what um this show that I was kind of in right now is trying to push for. Like really. Um, what I liked about the director was he was, uh, or the uh, playwright is he was so focused on giving uh, people of color a chance to like perform these roles. So he really made these characters kind of be more shaped around the actions they did as opposed to the identity that they had, but it's more so based on the race itself than it was right. on the color of skin. And I really appreciated that. Well, I, I appreciate it too, especially because, you know, with, with d and I've had this conversation with other people, not, not on shows, but in general. It's like, you know, it's kind of a fine line because they are fantasy characters, you know, using a character like Dritz Duarden as example for people listening that don't know, Dritz Duarden is a race of character known as a drow elf. And what a drow elf is, is a black skinned elf. Well, you can't get Brad Pitt to play that. That's just in poor taste. You know what I mean? <laughs> I mean, hey man, it's not, we're gonna stop people the first time. <laughs> True, but it, it is in poor taste to get somebody like me to play Dritz Duarden, sure. much as I would love to. Um, I mean, it's one of those things, you know, and it, it, it's, it's one of those kind of um, things where you, you celebrate it, you envy it at times too, where you're like, oh God, I wish I could, like for me, I always wish I could be in an August Wilson show. But I know those are all predominantly black roles, and it's right. for a good reason because it was written for those um, for those characters were supposed to be portrayed by uh, black people to give them that opportunity and also to tell those stories. You know, I, it's for me like I, I always try to look for Middle Eastern centric shows and try to see how I can uh, put that into like monologues I deliver or into like potential shows I can put up in the future as well. And it's really um, seeing what I can do for me and my people, I guess. It really is a lot of like um, self-sufficiency. You got to kind of do it on your own and you got to kind of start it on your own in a sense, you know, not really expecting um, a hand at a time. Though people are really been, have been very generous, I think, as of late when it comes to that kind of stuff, especially. Right. Well, the, I, would, I would imagine for somebody like you, as a, a gang, you said you're uh, Iranian descent. Yeah. especially in today's current climate i gotta imagine it, it sometimes you get roles based on your race where it's kind of like well that's you know borderlining stereotype isn't it it's more so for film than it is for theater of course but the problem with theater is its own different kind of thing this is a, a big kind of uh, topic that i feel like um if i were to go into a graduate program i want to try and discuss further but it's this issue right. of um you know other people of color playing completely different people of color and it's like Ew, are we are we towing the line here? I'm not exactly like Puerto Rican or stuff like that. Should I be in a Lin Manuel Miranda show like in the in the Heights or something like that? Or you know, uh, should I be Othello when Othello is more per, more often not predominantly uh, shown as being black? It's those right. kind of things where you look at it and you're like, where's the line? How do we approach the line? How do we discuss the line without offending people? It's a very difficult thing to try and tiptoe and, and really make sure that you're producing something that is um you know a good product while still being something that is within the the realm of possibility and also is not offensive it's, it's a very difficult thing to try and play around with and i can see why more often than not a lot of uh producers and directors just kind of wash their hands of it and like oh i made this creative decision because i i had no other options left it's like come on we can try and push it for it to be a little bit more inclusive in a sense it's, well, it's an upward battle it, it's kind of, it's kind of funny because uh the, the conversation especially in comic book films for example uh has has been around a lot where like changing a person's uh ethnicity or sexuality to to you know be inclusive to other people you know but you're you're changing an established character to do it and i i'm one of those those people i i'll, I'll admit it i'm one of those people i don't think that's a great idea because you're alienating your fan base I think it's a great idea to be inclusive. I don't think it's a great idea to change established characters. My argument has always been, and I will, I will die on this hill, create new characters, create new legends and, and, and mythoses. 
You know, I don't, I don't see the difficulty in that. Rather than changing Spider-Man, for example, create a new superhero. It's so, it's one of those things where it's like, I can see where the issue is because sometimes with a lot of big IPs, they don't want to take the risk anymore. Right. Like we already are sitting on our laurels. We already have an Iron Man and a Spider-Man. Why don't we just do different types of them? It saves us money. We don't have to worry about creating something and advertising it and making it into this big thing. So I get why it's not as like predominant, but honestly, I just think it's a little bit more of complacency than anything. Yeah. I've always said that if you want, if, if the world wants a transgender superhero, create one. It's, it's got to, you know, it's got to come from it though. You know, it's got to yeah. come from people that want to make it happen. Also having it be pushed enough where the, where the audience wants it as well. And when people see that, they're like, okay, that's marketable. That's always the biggest issue with acting is everything has to be marketable. It's oh, always cool. business first. Oh, of course. And I, I, I totally agree. It's what makes money. You know, uh, if 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 money will dictate that uh, Idris Alba be the next James Bond, which, by the way, I fully support uh, Idris Alba being the next yeah. James Bond. <laughs> I just want to go on record saying that I as soon as somebody um, put that rumor out there, I'm like, yes, he would fit. You know, <laughs> I mean, like his regular life. He's a cool guy. Dude. Yeah. He's a really interesting person. I'd be like, yeah, that could be Bond. I believe it. Oh, yeah. I'm I'm all for that. But I mean, like. You know, uh, when it's done for the purpose of the character or the story, I'm fine with it. When it's done just, like you said, for marketing and trying to jump on the bandwagon and making a quick buck, yeah, eh, come on. It, it's for the birds, man. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, people, you know, they just want to have something to look up to, at least. And I feel like the more we kind of push for it, eventually we'll get something out of it. And I'm hoping that, you know, new upcoming artists and creators, as they're kind of pushing their new ideas and products and IPs out there, people who are going to start accepting it will slowly start to shift the landscape. I think that's what I enjoy about this current climate, despite it being so rocky at times. Right. We want change. And I think we're slowly seeing it. That is awesome. Well, let's let's d- dig in here. I, uh, your IMDb is very. You've been talking about my IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> my IMDb. <laughs> <laughs> I guess I got to edit this part. Um... <laughs> oh, no, 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 kid. No, this is, this is hilarious because. So my IMDb. What I love about film acting is that, like you know, very much it's very pick up and go. Right. So, so this is a great example of it. I, I have all the references I, I need. And honestly, I should update my IMDb page. But the problem is with so much of it is oftentimes you go film something, 80% of the time, whatever you just filmed is dead at the cutting room floor. Right. And so it's like, if you're not doing a student production where they're already having to submit it for a grade, or it's with somebody who is putting money into it, it's, it's a little bit rocky in seeing if you're actually going to actually see that footage. Right. But with, with so much of like what I've done, it's always been like, I do the show. Oh, there's going to be a copy and credit. You know, you'll, you'll, you'll get some, some compensation possibly later. But, you know, after <laughs> some time, <laughs> I, I eventually get what, I, what is a copy of the film. And I'm like, oh, great. That's wonderful. Maybe I should go update my IMDb. And I just never really get behind doing it because I've been so focused on um, theatrical productions. For the past, maybe I would say, shoot, two years now, I've, for every month, barring Christmas time, every month I was in a stage production of a show. Okay. In some way, I was rehearsing for it in one, and it was just me just kind of pushing that idea of, I want to be a stage actor. I want to be on Broadway. I want to try and go to New York and do that kind of stuff. I want to go to Chicago or, or, or something like that. And now that I've kind of gone into this whole pandemic, I was taking a step back and I'm like, damn, I've done so much work for me as the artist. You know, I've done musical after musical uh, from like Into the Woods to the Adams Family musical to even Little Orphan Annie to, um, you know, more more serious kind of productions like. Um, time, time out, time out. Adams Family musical. Yeah. Who'd you play? Who'd you play? I got to know. So I was 19. So I tried going in there and I was I was slick my hair back. I had my mustache and everything. And I went in there like, oh, I'm 
trying to be Gomez Adams here, uh, being very <laughs> sexy and coming in like that, right? But they saw me and immediately they were like, let's make him Wednesday's boyfriend, the, the young nerd that has to shave his beard. And I swear, <laughs> when I shave my beard, I look, I look, you know, like college student guy, you know, mid 20s, something like that. But when I shave my beard, back to as if I was in high school again. <laughs> it, I look like, immediately, and then I had to come to the show. I'm like, hi, yeah, I'm, I, I'm playing Lucas. I'm Wednesday's boyfriend. And I just had to keep on speaking like this kind of voice where it's super much like breaking of like my, my vocal cords and stuff like that. And it's just so much of just playing with ages. I've gone from playing 18 year old Lucas Beinecke from the Adams Family to playing um, very classic um, straight play, Our Town. I played the stage manager in that show who's more often than not played by very older, distinguished kind of um, actors. Okay. It's, it's a lot of lines. I mean, for the first monologue of the stage manager in our town, it's five pages. Near. Jeez. And you're just, and you're rattling off and you got to talk to the audience and you got to connect with them and you really got to have a conversational tone because you're really talking to them. And right. my entire voice changes, my entire cadence changes, and I have to kind of become this whole completely different character who has a little bit more gravitas, for lack of a better word. And when you present that to an audience, they take it in a little bit more. They see how if you're standing a certain way, how your hair is done. Obviously, it wasn't this long back in the day. <laughs> but they see it, and, and you got to do everything you can to convince the audience of who you're playing is who you are. Right. And that's the really the, the main goal, especially for more of my straight plays where I've had to play kind of older characters in their 30s or even 40s at times. Because I have the luxury of facial hair, I always try to make sure that, and of course, without all this, I always try to present something that is a little bit older, that has a little bit more spark to it because I do have a little bit more youth that they don't have. Right, right. To give them something that they can believe when they see it. Well, you know, again, I, I, I got to dig into because you mentioned it numerous times. Like, so I got I have two questions that I want to get out. One is kind of stepping back and one is stepping forward as far as the, the, the stage is concerned. Uh, yeah. the stepping back, going back to the Wednesday or Wednesday Adams' boyfriend, Lucas, where you were giving the, uh, you know, the, the kid going through puberty voice. Yeah. You were expected to sing with that? It's, it's a really, it's a hard thing. So it's, <laughs> I, so I used to grow up a lot watching, um, you know, cartoons like Simpsons a lot. And what I love about the Simpsons is you would see these guys who would be singing these roles as a bunch of different characters. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking, I'm like, how the hell can they go from seeing like, um, like Quimby to Bard to Lisa to Homer. And like, and like some of these people are playing multiple, the same role, despite that not being their actual voice. And it's just slowly learning how to adapt to where you're placing it. So right. whereas if I was playing an older character, more often than not, the role would actually require my vocal range to be in a certain spot. So I wouldn't have to worry about speaking really high up here because the notes would never have to go up there. Right. Whereas Lucas, I lucked out because if I were to speak these kind of roles, I would also have to sing at this kind of range as well. So a lot of my singing would just kind of come out like this, essentially. So be very higher, a lot, a lot brighter and just, um, youthful in a sense. So, I mean, now I sound a lot older because of all my time smoking and drinking and partying at Rage State SDSU. So now it's kind of gone down a little bit, but back when I was younger, it was very much higher voice, a little bit softer, and I'm just kind of trying to speak and sing in the same kind of way. And it's learning to marry the two together. So your speaking voice or your singing voice sounds like your speaking voice anyway. That's kind of right. where you build on it. And then from there, you learn how to get approach the notes better. It's a whole mess. Musical theater is like learning how to speak all over again, honestly. Wow. And then the other thing I wanted to go into with, with the theater in general is uh, any, any desires to, I mean, I imagine like you, you take on the musicals, you take on the comedies, you take on the original, the formats, but any desire for uh, Shakespearean, you know, the thing that most stage actors are like, I was in Macbeth, you know, type deal. You know? Uh -huh. Yeah, um, Shakespeare has always been a kind of an interesting thing for me because I always kind of viewed myself as separate from Shakespeare. Like, I'm not a Shakespearean actor. That's for all those weird thespian guys. I'm an actor, you know? I act. Right. And, and as the more I kind of grew to learn about Shakespeare, the more I kind of realized, well, this dude was just writing funny comedies about 
the same things we always like dick jokes ass jokes and jokes about you know like miscommunication it's always been like the major thing that people enjoy saying mm -hmm. it's just presented in very heightened language but the thing is he would make such raunchy jokes and i can tell you how many dick jokes i found in romeo and juliet alone <laughs> one of the greatest love stories you read it and you're like jesus christ some of these guys are just awful you know it's, it's almost <laughs> as if it's like you're talking with your friends at the bar outside around two o'clock at night you know and you're just like damn this is this is it's, once you get the text of course then you can start seeing that a lot but, for York. Look at your O face. Oh. <laughs> Sadly drank too much, I suppose. But, you know, it's, and I, I actually had a luxury of, um, for um, coming to university, I actually got to uh, manage the production of Hamlet. So okay. that means I didn't get to act in it. I actually had to, like, stage manage all of the, uh, like, lighting and sound stuff, calling cues, uh, telling the actors to get ready for their places, making sure the audience is like ready and set in their spots and kind of putting all that kind of stuff together and really seeing Shakespeare from like kind of outside in and really knowing how much work has gone into the show itself, you start to appreciate how much um, heart was put into these works and how much time and care was really put in. And I think you get a kind of, I kind of grew to respect uh, Shakespeare and Shakespearean acting a little bit more because people don't really do too much of that heightened language like this anymore where we speak in slightly British tones and we try to pretend like we know what dust means. It's, we, <laughs> you know what I mean? It's, it's, we slowly started to learn to say lines like normal people or at least how we here and here in San Diego, California would deliver these lines like, for right. example, I had like a monologue where I had to um, read a line where I would say, Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me, which thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. And, and you know, you say that and you try to make sense of it. It's like, okay, what does that mean? You, you kind of break it back, peel it back and try to use some more vocal intention. You say, Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me, which thou shalt find I will most kindly requite. And you slowly start to get a better sense of it. But really, it's when you get the sense of what these words truly mean. Charles, I thank thee for thy love to me. Kind of flows right off the tongue. It's a simple thank you. Charles, yep. I thank the operative word there. For thy love to me. Me, it's like you're giving love to me. Which thou shalt find, which you'll find, I will most kindly requite. And then when you start to actually piece together who this character is, he's a bit of a conniving kind of character who really wants to try to get people on their side, even though he's going to make them do terrible things. It's like you start to get a better sense of like what these words are really trying to say. And, and then when you put them in modern times, it's basically like, Charles, you're my bro, and I've got your back. <laughs> exactly. It's like, that's the, and, and that's the thing. You want to try and get it to that kind of a point where – anybody who's listening to you can really understand what you're saying. That's the hard part about it. Right. It's not so much of understanding Shakespeare yourself, but it's to get people who have never watched Shakespeare, never seen Shakespeare, even if they don't get all the words, they get what you're doing. Nice. Nice. So the, the, the question still remains though. What, what's, what's the plan for, I know with COVID and everything, things yeah. are still kind of up in the air, especially for, for somebody like you who does other stage performances or even film. I know, you know, like a lot of a lot of films have been still on hiatus because of not knowing when this is gonna finally break free. What's in the future for you right now? For me personally, I'm just trying to get through college. Just get this stupid piece of paper that I paid what a couple <laughs> hundred, like tens of thousands of dollars for. You know, just put it on a plaque, put it on the wall, put on a resume, done with it, and then I can actually finally get to what I really wanted to do, which was learn more of my craft right that thing like as much as i love university they teach you the theory and the idea of acting and really the kind of applications of what your professors have learned and what works for them but to really learn how to act it takes like the same amount of time as you would with any other sport you have to drill it into you it's like daily regimented practice of working in like group settings like you're a football team or you're you know part of like a group of guys in the gym you are working together to put on something and i'm really hoping i can maybe go on to if 
COVID restrictions hopefully ease up, to go into conservatory style um, theater and really learn how to work with a cohesive unit. Because for me, I know, and I feel like a lot of people need to learn this fact, it's not about you. And I'm, I'm sure you and your time in pro wrestling, you can understand as well. It's not about you sometimes. It, on, on the surface, you know, you want to present it like you're the, the main guy of the show at times. But the whole ins and outs of it, it requires everybody working like it's a moving machine. And I want to try to learn to work with people like that and learn how to create a really solid company like that. So that hopefully I may be able to in the future produce my own work you know, write my own work that I'm currently trying to do even right now and just kind of put out my own theater because more often than not, it's like I see, okay, there's all these great shows that I can force myself into like a square peg into a round hole at times. Right. But I want to try and find shows that talk about me or my people. And then hopefully from there, I get to see more Iranian American actors in theater and on stage. I have already seen a good rise of them on film. One of my favorite actual actors, um, if you ever seen the TV series, What We Do in the Shadows on FX, okay. the uh, main character has my name. And I thought that was the coolest thing ever. Like his, <laughs> his name is Nandor the Relentless, but the, the actor's name is Kayvon Novak. And I see him and I'm like, holy shit, he has my name. I've never seen an actor have my name. I've never seen anybody have my name. That's crazy. So I look at him and I'm like, shit, if he's doing it, why can't I do it? I can be a vampire. Shoot, come on. <laughs> I, I highly recommend that series though. What We Do in the Shadows, funny mockumentary series. Very yeah. hilarious. Definitely got to check it out. Well, I can tell you this much, uh, Kabian. I've had an absolute blast with this one. Um, I am going to invite you on. I'm going to tell you right now. You you want to you want to get kind of a feel of what it's like to work work together as a team to try to make something work. I'll give I'll give you a shot. I'll invite you on as a special guest on one of our uh, weekly uh, uh, podcast shows, the uh, Breaking the Fourth Wall weekly podcast. What this is for people that are listening to the interview and don't really know that we started this. It's for the lack of better term, think of the veins of things like Howard Stern or, or uh, Opie and Anthony, Bob and Tom, Preston and Steve, morning talk, terrestrial radio talk shows, where we do segments and, and, and discussions in a comical way about things that we just decided to talk about. We got different sections, different segments, stuff like that. And uh, the best vein I can give it is, look, think of like not ready for primetime players. It's kind of what we're doing. And I think the group would absolutely love you. I think we got to have you on and have a blast. <laughs> I'm flattered, brother. Shoot, I'd love to. I mean, I haven't even told you about all the spooky stories. I had a bunch of ghost stories prepared, actually, in case we ever got to that point, too. But, like, if you want to talk about haunted stuff in San Diego. Oh, you, you know what? You got a story you want to you you delve into? I will tell you about this. Let's see if we can't get you on this Sunday. We, 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 well, we release it on Tuesday, but Sunday is when we record. Sunday at uh, – 1 p.m., 2 p.m. Uh, Eastern Standard Time. We started last week on one of our panelists who had had an, a haunting experience. And I would highly recommend if you want to be able to get on, we're going to continue that conversation this coming week. But uh, if you want to get on, I highly recommend you go check out last week's episode. I'll send you the link. So that way you could hear what, what she had gone through. And uh, an extra perspective would be awesome for, for, for part two. That'd be interesting. Is it this Sunday, the twenty third? Yes. I'll have to look into it. Okay, I, I'll I'll probably have to talk with Steve because I know I, I might have another meeting around sometime around there. But we'll check into it. Is it? It's one o'clock, two o'clock your time, or one o'clock, two o'clock my time? My time. My oh. Time. So I San Diego, you'd be like what? Ten o'clock? Ten? Ten? Eleven o'clock? Like that? Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, cool thing is, you know, since we both have Steve as a publicist to be able to go to and talk to, we'll just, you know, we'll work it out. We'll talk to Steve, see what he says. Well, Steve don't mind. Steve don't mind. Any, oh. any extra promotions, extra promotion. He's fine with it. <laughs> but yeah, no definitely worries. check out with him. <laughs> no worries. No worries. I, I, I would love to, honestly. Why not? Right on. But until then, uh, if people want to get in contact with you, either somebody who wants to actually uh, bring you on for plays or, or, roles or just the fans here listening 
that may have some questions that I didn't ask. Is there any way if uh, they'd be able to reach or contact you that you would like to? Yeah, yeah you can uh, reach me um, on my Facebook. Of course, it's Kayvon Mosin Zadif. Same thing is on here. You know, it's a lot of letters, but I'm sure you can do it if you type it in enough. And <laughs> it's on my um, Instagram and Twitter. Um, listed on there, at Suave Kebab. I'll even uh, put it in. It's uh, S-U-A-V-E Kebab, K-E-B-A-B. If you're looking on there, Suave Kebab. Nice. Pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, guys, we're breaking the fourth wall. You can find us on the Realm of the Mist uh, Entertainment YouTube channel. Just like, subscribe, comment, share this video out. If you're listening in audio-only format, guys, we got you covered there, too. Just check us out on Realm of the Mist Entertainment on Anchor.fm, Apple iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, iHeartRadio, or wherever quality podcasts can be heard. I want to thank Kavian again for hanging in with me. I hope he enjoyed it especially my little flub about his IMDb. <laughs> Don't worry about it. I got to update it myself. Thanks for the update. <laughs> no, not a problem. And of course, guys, we will catch you on the next Breaking the Fourth Wall interview. And make sure you stay tuned for this coming Tuesday for episode two of the weekly podcast. Talk to you later. No, 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 no. Not, not in... Hey guys, it's Chris from Realm of the Mist Entertainment. If you enjoyed this video, please hit that thumbs up button. Like, share, comment, subscribe. Check out all the other great podcasts that can be found on Realm of the Mist Entertainment's YouTube channel or our sister channel, Sounds Dicey Gaming, for all your tabletop needs. And if you prefer your podcasts in audio-only format, check out Realm of the Mist Entertainment on Anchor.fm, Apple iTunes, Spotify, Pandora, or wherever quality podcasts can be heard. To our Patreon supporters, we thank you very, very much. And if you're interested in being a Patreon supporter, please go over to patreon.com slash realm of the mist and just a dollar a month gives you exclusive content and helps our channel out greatly. Guys, again, thank you very much for joining us and we will see you on the next episode.